Glory be to his holy name. Amen. Amen. Welcome to our Wednesday midweek teaching and equipping session. And uh, if you're wondering where Shanti is joining from, and if you guess correctly, you might get a present from her in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Today, we are going to, uh, I think we did a, a session on this topic a couple of months ago, but the Lord has placed this topic in my heart again. And we'll be looking at it from a different uh, context today. The title is Confronting the Enemy. Confronting the Enemy. I think uh, somewhere in September or October last year, we did one session. Uh, today, we are going to look at how the greatest apostle of all times, Paul, he confronted the enemy in a particular situation. Now, if you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 13, you see how the Holy Spirit instructed the leaders of the church at uh, Antioch, telling them to separate Paul and Barnabas for the work of the ministry. And they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas and they sent both of them for ministry work. And thereafter they went to uh, uh, Seleucia and uh, through Cyprus. And they came all the way to an island called Paphos. Okay, so uh, the context for today's message is taken from Acts chapter 13, verses 6 to 12. Okay, this is after they, both of them, they were released into ministry. They came to a place, an island called Paphos. And there, the Bible tells us that there was a governor in this island. There was a governor in this island called Sergio, Sergius Paulus. And this man called Sergius Paulus, the Bible tells us that he wanted to listen to the gospel. He wanted to hear the word of God from Paul and Barnabas. And at the same time, there was a sorcerer, a magician, and also the Bible describes this person as a false prophet called Bar Jesus. His name was Elimus, Elimus, and he was also known as Bar Jesus. And he was a sorcerer, he was a false prophet, and this man, he prevented, he tried doing his best to make sure that Sergius Paulus didn't, that he wouldn't hear the word of God from Paul and Barnabas. Now, as this went on, the Bible tells us, it came to a point where Paul got really fed up with this guy, Elimas, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he commanded, he, in other words, he put this person in place. He said, you are, you are the enemy of all things and you are trying to prevent this good man from hearing the word of God. And then he commanded saying, you will not see for a while because the darkness will cover you. And the Bible tells us in verse number 11 and 12, a dark mist covered Elimas and he was not able to see. And when Sergius Paulus saw this, when he saw what happened, he believed because he saw the power of God demonstrated right before his eyes. Now, based on this true incidence, we are going to look at five important uh, teachings that we can take into our lives from this real account, from Acts chapter 13, verses 6 to 12. Here are five important lessons that we can learn from this incident. Number one, an intelligent man was friends with a false prophet. An intelligent man was friends with a false prophet. The Bible tells us this governor called Sergius Paulus was a very intelligent man. Where do we see that? In verses 6 and 7, when you read, the Bible says they went all the way across the island to Paphos where they met a certain magician named Bar Jesus, a Jew who claimed to be a prophet. Verse number seven, he was a friend of the governor of the island, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. So Sergius Paulus, the governor of this island called Paphos, 
he was a very intelligent man. Although he was an intelligent man, the Bible tells us that he was also friends with a magician. He was friends with a false prophet. An important principle we can derive out of this is intelligence cannot discern spiritual darkness. Only discernment can. Intelligence can't dissect light from spiritual darkness. Only discernment can. So although Sergius Paulus, he was a prudent and an intelligent man, he was friends with the wrong person. He was friends with the wrong person. Number two. Now, as I keep sharing the next couple of principles, think about your friends. Think about the people you associate in your lives. Think about the people you have given room into your inner circle of your life who have direct influence over your life because Elimas, the Bible tells us that he was a friend of this intelligent man called Sergius Paulus and being a friend, a close friend of Sergius Paulus, he prevented the good that was going to happen to Sergius Paulus. That is the second lesson that we can learn. Elimas prevented the good that was going to happen to Sergius Paulus. How, how do we know that? When you read verse 7 and 8 in Acts chapter 13, the Bible tells us the governor called Barnabas and Saul before him because he wanted to hear the word of God. But they were opposed by the magician Elimas, that is his name in Greek, who tried to turn the governor away from the faith. Look at this. Now here is Elimas and here is uh, Sergius Paulus. Sergius Paulus wanted to listen to the word of God. So he called Paul and Barnabas to him. And this man, being the friend of Sergius Paulus, he comes into the middle of the three of them and he separates. He blocked Sergius Paulus from hearing the word of God. So although Elimas was a friend of Sergius Paulus, he prevented the good that was going to happen to Sergius Paulus even for a little while. Think about the people who are connected to you. Think about your friends. Sometimes you may be having, you know, so-called friends in your life that you think, you know, you think that they will even lay down their lives for you. But little do they know the real motives and the intentions of their heart until the Holy Spirit himself will show that to you. So here are some important questions. Who are your friends? What influence do they have over you? Can they influence you in a way where you have no control over them? Do they show one face to you and prevent good happening to you? This is what exactly Elimas was doing to Sergius Paulus. He was showing Sergius Paulus one face. But at the same time, he was trying to prevent the good that was going to happen to him. Lesson number three. Paul realized that there was a spiritual block in Sergius Paulus from hearing the gospel. Paul realized that there was a spiritual block. Why? Because this man called Elimas, by Jesus, he was into sorcery. He was a magician. He was a false prophet. And he was dabbling with the occult, with demons. This is what he was doing. So clearly there was a spiritual block when it came to Sergius Paulus from hearing the gospel from Paul and Barnabas. So Paul realized that there was a spiritual block. Let's read verse number 9 and 10. Then Saul, also known as uh, Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked straight at the magician and said, You son of the devil, you are the enemy of everything that is good. You are full of all kinds of evil tricks, and you always keep trying to turn the Lord's truth into lies. No, we need to, from time and time again, we need to be able to discern roots that are spiritual. When people have issues in their lives, sometimes, or in, in some people, most of the times, the roots are demonic. Demonic means that they are spiritual. 
unless we identify these spiritual root issues, the problems will not get settled. So this is why discernment is important because Paul realized there was a spiritual block coming from Elimas. He didn't want such as Paul to listen to the word of God because he was dabbling with the occult. He was uh, having fellowship with demons. This is why he was trying to block Sergius Paulus from hearing the gospel. Lesson number four. Now here we come to a very important and interesting lesson. Paul didn't wait for someone else to confront the enemy first. Paul didn't wait for someone else to come into the picture and to confront the enemy and for him to follow after that person. He took the lead by himself. In verse number 11, in Acts chapter 13, the Bible tells us, Paul said, the Lord's hand will come down on you now and you will be blind and will not see the light of day for a time. He was bold to take the lead in confronting the enemy. Now there are children of God today, they wait for someone else to come and confront the enemy on their behalf. That's not how it has to work. Maybe when you become born again in your uh, early Christian days, when you are a baby Christian, during that time it may be all right. Maybe for the first couple of weeks, for the first couple of months up until you start uh, becoming mature in the Lord. Up until that time it's all right, but it comes to a point, my precious people of God, that we have to take the lead when it comes to confronting the enemy. We have to do that by ourselves. That's why Jesus said, I have given you authority over snakes and scorpions over all power of the enemy. And nothing by any means will ever hurt you. Luke chapter 10 verse number 19. And in Mark chapter 16 verse number 17, again, Jesus said after he died and before he, he rose again and before he ascended, he told his disciples, anyone who believes in my name, you will cast out demons and you will lay your hands on the sick and the sick will recover. So remember, an intelligent man called Sergius Paulus was friends with a false prophet. You have to get closer to the precious Holy Spirit of God every step of the way, every single day, until, uh, unless otherwise, you won't even know the kind of people that you are associating. Then number two, like I said, Elimas was preventing the good that was about to happen to Sergius Paulus. You may be having friends in your circle who are trying to prevent the good that is happening to you, but when you look at these friends, you are seeing a different picture. When you look at these friends, you have a different understanding about them in your heart. Number three, Paul realized there was a spiritual block in Sergius Paulus from hearing the gospel. And then, number four, he didn't wait for someone else to confront the enemy. He took the lead. He took the lead. He didn't even wait for Barnabas to take the lead. He took the lead. And this is taking the lead is something that happens when you are full of the Holy Spirit of God. This is something that we also see in the early church. The apostles in the early church, they were good at taking the lead in confronting the enemy. We see this in Acts chapter 3. When Peter and John, when they were going to worship in the temple called Beautiful, what happened? Paul didn't wait for uh, John to take the lead. Uh, sorry, Peter didn't wait for uh, John to take the lead. He healed that person there. He said, silver and gold I may not have, but as much as I have, let me give that to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you rise up and walk. Another example in Acts chapter 14, what happened in Lystra when there was a man who hadn't walked from birth? Again, Paul took the lead. He took the lead and he allowed the Holy Spirit of God to heal this precious person through him. So you have to take the lead when it comes to confronting the enemy. Don't wait for someone else to come into the picture and to confront the enemy on your behalf. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, it happens. But you as a child of God, you must take the responsibility in 
when it comes to confronting the enemy you have your own responsibility when it comes to this and last but not least god confirmed his word through paul and the governor became a believer how beautiful is that god confirmed his word what happened when paul told elimas your son of the devil you always try to deceive people and therefore for what you are about to do a darkness will cover you right now and immediately just as he said that the bible tells us that elimas felt a dark mist cover his eyes verse number 11 and 12 and he walked about trying to find someone to lead him by the hand when the governor saw what had happened he believed for he was greatly amazed at the teaching about the lord can you see this when the governor saw what had happened he believed you need to understand miracle signs and wonders they are primarily they are mainly for unbelievers miracles are mainly for unbelievers because So most of the time their hearts are hardened with unbelief have you come across people who say unless i see something i won't believe i have come across people like that they say unless i see something i won't believe and you see jesus explaining this beautifully in the gospel of john where he says unless you see you are unbelieving jews unless you see you will not believe and that's why jesus was performing miracles the same way this governor called sergius paulus in the island called paphos he believed and he became a believer the moment he saw what happened to elimas and like i said a little while ago think about the people who you have given room into you no know, to to influence you you have to be careful be mindful about your friends because if you don't get closer to the holy spirit the best friend your best friend at any given time must be the holy spirit he should be your best friend and when you take the lead don't be afraid to take the lead when it comes to confronting the enemy you have to do that over yourself you have to do that over others as well but it starts with you it starts with you it starts with me i've shared this several times when you are, when you are in an aircraft when they make their announcements they say if there is a, a compression of the air in the cabin you will see the uh, mass which just fall down in front of you from the top and first you help yourself before you help someone else the same way my precious people of god let the holy spirit help you where you take the lead in confronting the enemy and don't entertain thoughts of the enemy the moment you know that you are that there are thoughts in your mind that are not from the holy spirit you have to confront those thoughts when the enemy is whispering lies to you about someone else which you know the holy spirit will never do you must confront the enemy then and there that's important and when you do that god will con- confirm his word just like he confirmed his word through paul now when you confront the enemy how you should how should you do that the most effective way when it comes to confronting the enemy is by confronting him with the word of god now in order for us to confront the enemy with the word of god first and foremost we must know the word of god This is why I always encourage you, you know, we meditate on the word of God as much as you can as often as you can sometimes it may be just a couple of verses but at the same time if you meditate for example on a couple of verses in the morning take maybe one hour in the evening and read maybe about five to six chapters in the bible sometimes you know you can read certain books like reading a story book in the bible for example if you are saying oh pastor brother what are you telling the gospel is matthew is too long it has more than 20 chapters also well there are other books in the bible that has very less chapters spend time 
in the word of God as much as you can because when it comes to confronting the enemy, knowing the word of God is not an option. Knowing the word is an absolute must. Let me give you the best example I can give you. When Satan came to tempt Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, and in Luke chapter 4 also we see this, when Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights all by himself, when he came to tempt Jesus, how did he tempt Jesus? He tempted Jesus with the word of God. Jesus counter-attacked the temptations with the word of God itself. Jesus started quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6.16, Deuteronomy 8 uh, verse 3. These are the verses that you find where Jesus gives the answers to the devil. So for example, when you hear a lie from the enemy saying, no, no, things are not going to work out. For example, you have taken a step of faith and you are waiting. You are in the waiting season and the enemy whispers and says, oh, you are waiting for such a long time. What if this doesn't come through? What if that approval is not going to come through? What if they have misplaced the documents? No, let me, at that very moment, you must confront the enemy by saying, no, all things work together for me. All things work together for the good for me because I love my Lord. When fear comes your way, quote 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse number 7 and say, my father has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When you're going through a challenging time, when all these defeated thoughts starts mounting up in your mind, you confront that by saying, according to Psalm 25 verse number 3, defeat does not belong to anyone who trusts the Lord. And that is me. Because I trust my Lord and because I trust my Lord, defeat defeat is not my portion. Hallelujah. When you are holding on to a promise of God and when the enemy comes lying and saying, Oh, this is not going to come to pass. Why is God slow when it comes to answering his prayers, his promises? You say, no, according to Proverbs chapter 30, verse number five, my God is the promise-keeping God. He makes promises. And all his promises are yes and amen, my precious people of God. This is why as a servant of God, I encourage all of you to spend more time in the word of God. If you Confront the enemy with the word of God. Remember, God's word will never return back to him empty-handed without accomplishing what he has intended and purposed in his heart. God's word will always accomplish what he has purposed. Amen. So the word of God has a purpose and God will achieve the outcome through his purpose and in order for that to happen, First and foremost, the believers must be fully, they must know the word of God. They must carry the word of God in their hearts. The more you do that, you know, the more you carry the word of God in your heart, you will notice that you become a quiet person. What I mean by that is you don't jump the gun to do things. You're not not in a rush. The moment you begin to carry the word of God in your heart, you will realize that you have, you become, that you are becoming a very peaceful person. Because Romans chapter 15 verse number four says, scripture gives us comfort. Scripture is full of comfort and scripture gives us comfort according to Romans 15 verse four. Therefore, when you meditate the word of God, naturally you will become a very peaceful person. And others will want to associate you. They will want to come and sit next to you and wait saying, oh, you're such a peaceful person. And the the peace of the Holy Spirit that is in you will minister to that person. Amen. So the word of God is what we must feed on. Do that if if you spend meditating on the word of God in the morning. Brilliant. Keep it up. Don't stop. Be it one verse or just one chapter, that's good. But in the night, again, when everything is done, when you have finished all your work, you put your children to sleep, done all that, try to take maybe another 15 to 20 minutes. Read at least two to three chapters. I always you know, say this, we were back in the days, we were trained to, you know, uh, to read 
around 21 chapters a day when we came into ministry. That's the kind of discipline that was infused into us. And that's good discipline right there. Now you need to come up with your own discipline. You don't necessarily need to read 21 chapters a day like it happened with us. But what is your discipline? What do you do? Because the disciple is a person who is under discipline. So in order to know the word of God, you must be well disciplined in spending time with the word of God. So that is how you confront the enemy. In order to confront the enemy, you must know the word of God. You must carry the word of God in your heart. And when you carry the word of God in your heart, what happens? Just like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse number 34, out of the abundance of his word in your heart, your mouth will speak. Jesus said, it's out of the abundance of a person's heart, the mouth speaks. So when you carry more of God's word in your heart, out of that abundance of God's word in your heart, your mouth will speak at any given moment. So I bless you with this message today. Learn to take the lead when it comes to confronting the enemy. Don't wait for someone else to come and take the lead. You take the lead for yourself. Take the lead in confronting the enemy. Don't be reckless. Don't be scared when it comes to confronting the enemy. That fear of the enemy is given by the enemy himself. But I declare and decree in Jesus' name that all of us, we are going to see the greater power of the Holy Spirit manifesting in our lives as we take the lead and confront the enemy. Amen. So God bless you. God bless you.